Welcome to Lair of the Alchemist, where we discuss all things heavy metal and hard rock. We are back with another episode of Midweek Maiden. And for this Midweek Maiden, we are doing an in defense of, an in defense of their 1990 album, No Prayer for the Dying. And for this episode, I have a special guest joining me from Stockholm, Sweden, Matthias Reinholdsen. He is a hardcore Iron Maiden fan. He is part of the duo that uh, put together the Maiden Stockholm YouTube channel. I had Matthias's and my uh, friend Henrik here for our uh, deep Prague, hidden Prague gems. I will leave a link to Maiden Stockholm in the description down there. It's a fascinating video where Matthias and Henrik go around Stockholm and the surrounding area showing you all the venues that Iron Maiden has played through their whole career. Matthias is also a musician. He has a band Dead Cosmonaut and Boss Group Trey. We will, I will leave links in the description for those bands also. And he's been here at the Lair before. He was here way back early in the uh, early days of the Lair for an Iron Maiden Deep Cuts video. He was here for a Candlemass video that we did. So it is nice to have him back. Matthias, thank you for joining me here again at the Lair. Thank you very much for having me. And it's a pleasure to be here, Midweek Maiden, and talk about No Pray for the Dying. Okay, so No Prayer for the Dying, 1990. It comes off of The Seventh Son after The Seventh Son of The Seventh Son album. Yeah. Adrian Smith has left the band. Yannick Gares is now in the band. It's kind of a, the band a little bit at a crossroads. I think Bruce is, mm -hmm. is unhappy. Some rumblings here from Bruce. Adrian has left. The band not quite sure what, what they want to do, where they want to go. They they kind of with this album go back to a, a bit more of a stripped down sound after Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, which kind of had the keyboards and the more progressive, elaborate uh, production and the songs mm -hmm. and everything. And it's kind of an album that's a little bit divisive for some fans, depending on where you got in with Iron Maiden. I did my video on uh, my years away from metal, and I talked about how right around 89, I stepped back from metal for a few years. So I missed out on this album in Fear of the Dark. I didn't come back around to these albums till maybe 94, 95, when this stuff started getting reissued on CD. So uh Tell us, tell us your thoughts on the record, maybe some history also behind the record, why this is an album that, that some fans like and some fans don't. Yeah, to give you a bit of background, uh, personally, uh, when it came out, I was 16 and I was a, a diehard Maiden fan. So a new Maiden record was like the event of the year. Uh, and uh, I almost say, said, of course I liked it, and I still do. But there were some things that I found a bit, uh, how should I put it, out of character for Maiden. Uh, what I did personally miss uh, at the time is that it didn't have like the, the Maiden epic. Mother Russia, the last song is the longest one, and that's still under six minutes, I think, something like that. And I, so that was a bit of a okay this is odd it had more songs it had 10 songs compared to to the well from power slave they had all had eight songs but they were a bit longer so the songs were a bit shorter another thing that i personally thought was a bit uh disappointing perhaps was the the artwork and not just the not just the, the i mean the sleeve it's a bit crude but uh, also, at the same time, it, the, the, the layout of the album didn't have all those details. It wasn't like, it wasn't the album that you could stare out, stare at for weeks and, and, and discover more and more details. Uh, everything was a bit stripped down, sort of back to basic. And I remember at the time when they put it out, uh, in interviews, they talked a lot about it being sort of now we're getting back to, to killer's mode uh, for a more hard rock driving mode like they ha had on killers. And being 16 years old, I was, of 
of course, well familiar with, with killers. But I couldn't really see the comparison that much. I think today the, the comparison is a bit contrived, perhaps. But I mean, yeah, the songs are a bit more straightforward. But on the other hand, there is no song like Prodigal Son on No Pray for the Dying. Stuff like that. There isn't any purgatory. Uh, but all that said, I really enjoyed the album. And there are many songs that I think is, uh, is really, really good. When did you discover the album or rediscover the album? Yeah, it really wasn't until probably the mid 90s when the Iron Maiden albums were reissued or maybe put out for the first time in the US. Actually, I know that there were those double disc castle Iron Maiden uh, mm -hmm. yeah, versions, yeah. but I don't think those were readily available here in the US. They were like an import. So when everything was reissued, I went and got the ones that I that I didn't have already in Fear of the Dark and No Prayer of the Dying. I got them right at the same time. And uh, I, I liked this album more than Fear of the Dark, although I, I, I kind of had it. It felt like uh, when I listened to it for the first time, it, it would felt lacking in a lot of different areas. And you mentioned the cover and you know, this is the, you think about the somewhere in time cover with all those little mm -hmm. things yeah. and references on the cover. And here, like you said, it's almost like this is like, wasn't finished or something, you know, here's, I guess, supposed to be like part of the, the grave or something. There would have been an inscription or something on this. And I thought I read that there was supposed to be something, but it didn't happen. There would be little things and the album sort of feels like that to me also there are songs that and the album has actually grown on me over time but when i first listened to it i couldn't help com but compare it to the classic era so tail gunner mm -hmm. even though i like tail gunner it feels like a weaker version of ace is high uh, mm -hmm. no prayer for the dying feels like a weaker version of revelations or infinite dreams mm -hmm. uh, and there's just a bunch of things uh, mother russia feels like an inferior version, a much more inferior version of Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner or Hallowed Be Thy Name. Mother Russia, by the way, I just checked is five minutes and 30 seconds long. So mm. being that it's the quote epic on the record, it, it even comes up short in that mm. area. So it was a weird album. It didn't grab me right away. Over time, I do mm. find myself kind of listening to it a lot because they never really played any of these songs after this tour. You know, they pretty much don't play songs from this record. So it feels like an album that has a lot of deep cuts on it. And over time, mm -hmm. I've, Absolutely. I've, I've come to appreciate things like Fate's Warning and uh, Run, Silent Run Deep, Mother Russia, uh, maybe The Assassin. Uh, also, it for me as a bass player, you're a bass player too. It's yeah, kind of the yeah. last time where Steve has that more busy bass style. It seems like he has yeah. a little bit on Fear of the Dark, but this is his bass style here still sounds like the way he was playing in the in the 80s. He would start to sort yeah. of move, move away from that. So I enjoy the album for that. Uh, I never cared for Bruce's vocal style on this. Like he went for kind of a more gruffer style to his voice there are some duds on this record like hooks in you and uh for me bring your daughter to the slaughter uh mm -hmm. did he never cared for those songs i was never even a, a much of a big fan of uh, holy smoke it felt a little bit too acdc mm -hmm. like for me i mean it's okay but and all the iron maiden records before this yeah there were some songs i liked better than others but there were no really duds on any of the previous Iron Maiden records, whereas this record, it felt like there's some duds on this. And when you factor all these things in, the strange way that Bruce is kind of singing a couple of duds here, songs that are good, but just don't quite reach that level of power slave or peace of mind and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. It just feels like a, a step down, but it is an album that that has grown on me over the years. And I do find myself reaching for it a lot. 
because I'm not burnt out on any of these songs and it feels like there's little things I can discover on this record. Yeah. Uh, I, I sort of agree with you uh, that it was maybe not a step down, but it was a, a, a step in a, a bit surprising direction because up till Seventh Sun, they had gone for and sort of distilled their sound more and more and more. And then they do this, which was kind of like, okay, I didn't see that coming. Uh, but one, one of the things that I really enjoy about the album is the production of the album. And I know many fans really don't like the production of this album. In all, in fairness, I can see why you don't like it. But me personally, I am very fond of what I would like to call rehearsal space recordings. This sounds really like they're in the rehearsal space, which they literally were. They recorded it at home uh, in a barn that they made it into a studio uh, at Steve's place, uh, just outside London. Uh, and they got the Rolling Stone mobile that they had used, uh, that Martin Birch, their producer, had used before. Uh, and in 1990, it was on its last legs. So I guess in that respect, it wasn't ideal to record. But to me, what sounds so cool is it really feels like that you're, that you're in the room with a band. The drums sound as if you're standing in a room with someone playing the drums. The guitars sound like that. The bass sound like that. And I just think it's, uh, it has so much fire and spirit spark in it. There's so much energy in the recording. Sometimes when, when uh, the sound quality doesn't really fit the material is in the more mellower songs like, uh, like the title track, No Pray for the Dying. That comes up a bit short, perhaps. But I mean, for the rockers on this album, and there are quite a few, it really sounds like you're in there, you're with the band while they're playing these songs. As for Bruce's vocals, uh, I don't think he himself is that satisfied with the outcome of it. I, I think he said somewhat, they called it his angry fox voice. But it sounds like an angry fox. I don't know about that. But I mean, this raspy quality is sometimes works. Sometimes it just feels a bit like a bit lazy, perhaps, that he doesn't try to, to reach the, the notes. Um, but... I think I, I don't think it was lazy. I, I think it was more conscious, but maybe it was uh, a bit wrong choice for some of the songs. Uh, but I don't agree with you that when you say that uh, uh, Tail Gunner is like a, a, a secondhand version of Aces High, even though there are, I mean, there are uh, aircrafts uh, in both songs, of course, and the war theme and so on. But I mean, a, a song like Tail Gunner, I would shit my pants if they play that song live. Mm -hmm. I just love it to bits. And it's re a really nice song to play to play on the bass as well. Yeah. It's got nice modulations as it's moving along. Little stuff, it's just like you said before, it's got this busy Steve bass. And the rhythm section, I mean, Nico and Steve are at the top of their game throughout this whole album. Nico's playing is fluid and yeah. he has the sort of laid back but full on energy all the way through this album. Uh, I just think that those two really lock in together and it's like a showcase for any rhythm section to listen to this album and what are these guys doing. At the same time, knowing now what happened afterwards, they went for Fear the Dark, was, which was kind of a a reaction against this. Uh, Bruce said something in, in an interview I read that he heard the, a Dream Theater album and thought that why is this new band have an album that sounds better than, than an Iron Maiden album? It shouldn't be like that. We should make a proper album, a good sounding album. And they ended up with Fear the Dark, which to me, it doesn't really have the same spark, doesn't have the same energy. Maybe it's down to the songs, but also a bit in the quality and the drum sounds, I think, the snare and 
stuff like that. But I mean, it was a conscious move away from no prayer. And as you said yourself, they don't really go back to these songs. Uh, Bring a Daughter was a surprise number one uh, hit uh, because they released it in the week between Christmas and New Year. So when no one releases album or singles, uh, so of course they just went, they released a multiple format with picture discs and poster sleeves. So of course they went into number one in the UK. <clears throat> so it's somehow considered to be a, a hit song, but uh, I honestly don't know that many Maiden fans that think it's as good as their more, I mean, like Run to the Hills or Number of the Beast or The Trooper. Yeah. But sometimes they brush that up to play that one live, uh, which is a bit boring. And I agree with you. Uh, I think Hooks in You, which is a song that Adrian wrote the music for just before he left the band, but stayed on. Uh, and uh, uh, and bring your daughter are, for me, the 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 two weakest songs. But let let's have a, a short run through of the, of the of the titles here. So first, it's Tail Gunner. It's a Harris Dickinson song. I love it. I like I said before, it's got it's got great songwriting. Uh, it just flows really nice. Has a really good energy. Uh, Holy smoke. Maybe it's a bit basic perhaps but then again it's it's a bit it's a bit fun and the lyrics is quite funny with bruce going at the tv evangelists uh and that's uh that's always a, a good cause in my book <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh and the video i think the video when it came out was really like a home video i guess you've seen the the video for it yeah yeah, they're in. A, I mean, it's the only video of uh, of a guitar player staying in, in a stream doing a guitar solo. But I mean, Dave Murray is, is knee deep in a little stream playing his guitar, <laughs> and Steve is riding a tractor yeah. <laughs> with Vic Vella, stuff like that. I mean, it's just silly all the way through. But I mean, it's good fun, sort of fits uh, the title track. Could have been worked on a bit more, could have been a bit longer. The sound, like I said before, could have been a bit better, but I really like that. I think it's, uh, uh, I mean, if, if Steve had done that song today, it would have been like 11 minutes long. Yeah. Because yeah. he would. <laughs> so, in that sense, this is, this and Fear of the Dark are the two last albums of Steve writing songs that are, I mean, lean to the point songwriting. And I don't diss the, the new Steve songs, but I mean, come on, it would be great if Steve could write like a short rocker, like, like any of these songs on this album. I think the last one that's kind of short and to the point is Future Real, and that was Virtual Eleven. So that's quite a few years ago. Public and Enema number one, Okay, it wins the contest for the most tasteless uh, uh, <laughs> title, of course. But I really like the melodies, and I like yeah. the I like the song very much. It's a it's a, a Dave song uh, with uh, Bruce, and I think the 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 lyrics are better than the title. It's yeah, I don't know the, why they went with that title. It's such a shame because I do like that song. I think the melody line is really good. It, the, the, yeah. the the goofy juvenile title just sort of cheapens the song, which is a shame. The, I mean, but at the same time, it's so much Bruce. He's getting this idea when he's sitting by himself, chuckling at his pun, public enema number one, and he thinks it's funny. Yeah, and okay, no it would have been funny if it was a line in the song. It, it shouldn't have yeah. been the song title. It's, it just no, no, it shouldn't. But at, but at the same time, it goes like, why didn't any one of the other guys say, but come on, Bruce, that's a bit, <laughs> that's a bit childish. Let's go for something else. But I mean... Well, anyway, and, and I, here I, we I are, Iron it. Maiden. This is this is another thing for me. You know, Iron Maiden is this band that the lyrics. You know, he had, uh, you know, uh, Alexander the Great and these mm -hmm. sort of thoughtful lyrics. And I remember being taken aback by the sort of some of the lyrics on here are just really kind of silly. And then the, the title of this song is silly. Uh, 
it just there's there's some elements of on this right bring your daughter to the slaughter that title to me and i know that that was supposed to be in a horror movie bruce's solo band was supposed to do that so i guess it would have made sense in the context of a horror movie but it just seems so like slapdash thrown thrown together slaughter daughter what rhymes with slaughter daughter you know and it just for iron maiden a band <laughs> whose whose level uh, lyrics you know, we're always on kind of a different level, kind of thinking man's metal. You know, this is this is Judas Priest, ram it down, turbo era, you know, dumbed down kitty type song titles and, and everything. So I remember being taken yeah. aback and that turning me off a little bit that I wasn't getting mm -hmm. sort of those intelligent Iron Maiden lyrics that I felt we had on all the other records. You get that some on here, like Fate's mm -hmm. Warning, I, I think you know, is, mm -hmm. is and even public enema number one, the lyrics themselves, I think are pretty good. It's yeah, just yeah. The title, Absolutely. you know, there's just certain elements that they, you know, I just, I don't quite know what they were thinking with, with some of these things. Uh, it's uh, hastily made decisions that doesn't, didn't stand the test of time, really. Like you said, Fate's Warning is another Dave song that Harris wrote, uh, Steve wrote this lyric for. Uh, that's a good one too. It's a bit of a, uh, I know a few people think it's a bit boring, perhaps, but I really like it. Yeah. As, same as the, the one after that with his Run Silent, Run Deep. Bruce at the time said something about that on his first solo album, Tattoo Milliardaire, there was this song called Dive, 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 which has a lot of submarine uh, mm -hmm. sort of theme. But uh, when you read the lyrics for Dive, 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 you it's not about submarines, it's about sex. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and he said something like Run Silent, Run Deep, which I think is a title from, from a film, uh, is, is the more serious grown up version of, of <laughs> but with the simple. I mean, but that, that's a really good one too. Uh, that's uh, another one of Harris and, and, uh, and Dickinson composed. Hooks and You, like I said, falls a bit short, it's a bit doesn't really stand the test of time. In hindsight, it's, they, they bring in this new guy, Janet Gerst, who makes his debut, which in turn also has a bit of a few surprising elements to it. Like previously when Dave and Adrian played together, Dave was always this guy that just played more spontaneous off the cuff sort of solos, just going for it while Adrian was the more laid back, phrasing kind of guy, entered Danny Gers into the band. And then all of a sudden, Dave, a lot of Dave solos on this one and on Fear of the Dark is more, more phrasing, more laid back. And Janik does the old Dave trick, right. which is awesome. kind of interesting when you, yeah, when you think of it. Because I, uh, so what I was trying to say is that they're bringing this new guy, the old guy song is still on the album. Why is that? It's not like it's Hooks in You is a totally crap song, but if they got this new guy who is well capable of, of writing songs, why didn't they spend like a week and two trying to get him in, more into the band? But they, it's, it's a bit typical Maiden. They have a new guy, but all the songs are done. We're about to record now, so let's go. It's yeah. not like, okay, and I think maybe they learned a bit of a lesson uh, for when, when Blaze came into the band, that they gave it more time for Blaze to be able to contribute more than Jan did when he uh, made his debut with this album. I actually Bring like the guitar tour. solos on the record. I think that the, yeah. there's a lot of really great guitar solos. I like the tone on the guitar solos. And you were talking about the production earlier, how some people don't like this production. I, I'm going to go out on a, on a limb here, probably get blasted for this, but I actually think Somewhere in Time and Seventh Son are too reverbed out. They're, they're too echoey and sort of the synths wash them out a little bit. Love those records. Mm -hmm. But I mm -hmm. think that those albums sound a little bit dated to me. The drum sounds on there. So yeah. I actually prefer this with it's, it's more stripped down. It's, you can hear it's guitar, guitar, bass, drums in the middle. You can yeah. hear everything. There's a little bit more clarity. It's not sort of washed out and all these sort of echoey mm -hmm. reverb 
that I mean, it exactly. works on those two Maiden albums. So, so yeah, yeah, of course. Somewhere in time, but uh, I've like you, I've always liked the production on this record. I thought, whereas Fear of the Dark, it got a little too stiff and boxy. Maybe that yeah. was the performances. Maybe that was the songs. Maybe it was the production. Maybe it was a combination of all three. Uh, mm. But I've always liked the production on this record. You can hear everything. Uh, I think the guitars sound good. I especially like the lead sounds uh, that they have. So, mm. Exactly. I think, and I, I mean, to draw a comparison to another album, I love the production of uh, uh, Never Say Die uh, with Black Sabbath, which it also has this kind of really rehearsal space deluxe sound to it where you can hear everything the separation is exceptional you can hear everything but i mean most people likes a bit more reverb kind of sound maybe you and i are are a bit different in that respect uh, but i really like the production another song that i didn't mention is assassin which I, and i i know this from friends i've talked to that they think that they don't like the song because the the part where you go assassin yeah. assassin yeah. i mean they could have just left out the assassin chanting assassin a few times that's that, that's a steve song but it, i mean if you listen to the drums and the bass on that one super busy bass yeah. nice yeah, guitar really. leads uh i i really think that's a super cool song with nico playing it yeah i agree i mean it's so I mean, it's laid back with, with still pushing on with his energy. I think it's really great. A little bring your daughter. They, the little on assassin there. There's a little lick that they play. But da -da 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 -da, better watch out that one like really quick little fast lick they play together yeah. like the drums. Do -do 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 -do. Yeah, <clears throat> it's, I think it's do -do 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 yeah. Yeah. Fun one to play too. It's good to get your fingers going, <laughs> playing a bit of assassin on the bass. Uh, like I said, Bring Your Daughter was, like you said yourself, uh, was done for uh, Terror on Elm Street 5. There are uh, uh, Bruce's uh, version with Jan on Janik on, on guitars, of course, available uh, to, to listen to. Bruce's version is much more laid back and doesn't have that same spark as the Maiden version. Uh, I think the Maiden version is better, but then again, it, it's not one of my favorite Maiden songs at all. And finishing uh, Mother Russia, I think the verses lack a bit of quality, but the instrumental parts for Mother Russia is just fantastic. I think it's so cool. Great solo section, uh, good vibe, uh, but uh, then again, the verses just break, bring it down a bit. And like I said before, if Steve wrote that song today, I think it would be more than 11. I think it would be about around 15, 16 <laughs> minutes long. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> uh, but I mean, and again, it doesn't seem like this is a, a favorite within the band at all. They, they rarely play. I mean, they play Bring Your Daughter then again. But I mean, there's not much love for, for No Pray For The Dying, even from the band themselves. But so I but I would like to give give it give it a chance and really listen listen to it. it. It sounds good if you try to pick out the all those nice details with the production and the playing. It's a really good album. On a rank from bottom to top, for me it sits around the middle actually. Uh, uh, well, I, I agree uh, with you that uh, <clears throat> yeah, it is a. I think part of it is you mentioned Never Say Die earlier. Sometimes when bands are at certain parts in their career where things aren't going that well, they don't have fond memories of those albums that they made. Black Sabbath does not have fond memories of Never Say Die. I think here Bruce is starting to get unhappy. Adrian has yeah. left. It's sort of <clears throat> the 90s are now starting. Metal is moving, starting to move in a different direction. It's an uncertain time. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably why the band has doesn't look back on this album as you know maybe they don't have as fond of memories of uh, of making this album. But all right, I'm going to put you on the spot as we're getting close 
close to the end here. I'm going to put you on the spot. You mm-hmm. just you just gave mm-hmm. it a ranking. Would you rank this album higher than any of the first seven records? <clears throat> No. No, I wouldn't. Okay. Uh, I think we'll maybe, maybe. Who does it give a run this, for the money for? Is there, is there an album that it could almost beat out? From yeah, m- maybe somewhere in time. Maybe somewhere in time. Maybe the first one. But I mean, at the same time, both Somewhere in Time and the, the debut is so iconic. Yeah. And like I said, when I when I started off talking about the cover and all the details and I mean somewhere in time was like it was an album that you could like immerse yourself into it was all the details the lyrics you could read the lyrics and have like a history lesson and I mean all this stuff which is not really there on No Pray for the Dying so just on songs alone maybe they're a bit they're, they're pretty close. The first one is so iconic, it's hard to, but I mean, a song like Charlotte the Harlot, other better songs of No Pray for the Dying than that one for me. Yeah, there is. So, I mean, yeah, it's hard to say, but probably not. Okay. At the How same about... time. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. For, well, for me, I agree with the same thing. And even though I was sort of talking down on the production of Somewhere in Time, it, it does give that album a certain atmosphere. And I just think the song is yeah. better. And, yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. Uh, all right. How about, would you rank it higher than any of the re- re- Reunion, Rob, Return of Bruce era albums? Yeah, I would. Uh, I would. I think it's better than uh, Final Frontier. I enjoy it more than listening to to Brave New World. Uh, I think I enjoy it a bit more than perhaps even perhaps even maybe uh, Book of Souls too. Okay. But it's not better than Senjutsu. I don't think it's better than A Matter of Life and Death. Those two are albums I think uh, I hold close to my heart, actually, yeah. Uh, for me, I would put it above, I, I'd probably put it above Dance of Death, and I would put mm. it above maybe The Final Frontier, probably The Final mm. Frontier. Dance of Death is a bit, it's a bit up and down. I think the, 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 the highlights of, uh, of Dance of Death is, is I mean, a song like Passchendaele yeah, is yeah. perhaps the best they've done yeah. since Adrian and Bruce returned to the band. At the same time, there are songs that are, so yeah, may, maybe, maybe. Yeah. It, depends on, it depends on the weather. Yeah, <laughs> which way the wind is blowing. Yeah, how, how am I feeling today? Is it a good day? Is the sun shining? I don't know. <laughs> All right, well, uh, you got any final words you want to say on No Prayer of the Dying before we wrap it up? No, I think I've talked enough. You uh, made your case. <laughs> All right, the jury, case. the jury uh, will deliberate on this. Uh, yeah. and the jury is you, the, the viewers out there. So you guys let us know. <laughs> bring it on bring it yeah. on <laughs> uh, let us know in the comments down below what you guys think of no prayer for the dying what were your first impressions of it when you first heard it let us know too how it ranks for you inside the iron maiden catalog does it rank higher than any of the first seven records how does it compare to the reunion rob era uh, albums let us know in the comments down below what you think. Make sure you check out uh, Matthias's uh, Made in Stockholm YouTube channel and some of his bands. I'd like to thank Matthias for joining me here again at The Layer. Thank you. Thank and, you very much for having me. And uh, we'll see you. Uh, I have a feeling he's going to be back for another midweek Maiden episode. Uh, so you, I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> sure you're going to see him again here at Midweek Maiden. Uh, let us know also if you have some topics for Midweek Made and you want us to cover. I'm going to have a bunch of different guests on here. And uh, so let us know in the comments down below. And we'll see you again at the next uh, Midweek Maiden. And until we see you again, make sure you stay heavy, stay metal. Yeah. Up the irons. <laughs>